Hey, Harold Hornets! I hope everyone is doing fantastic tonight as you prepare for the 4th of July festivities tomorrow. Um, for grades 3 through 8, as you're watching, I did want to make sure that I got on and a little bit more often so that we could stay up to date with the story and where we are and where Melody is in her life. So remember her... Um, she has the photographic memory, and she is way smarter than people give her credit for, and she is at elementary school. Um, so she's given us a little bit of a background into her life up to this part. So, chapter seven. When I sleep, I dream, and in my dreams, I can do anything. I get picked first on the playground for games, I can run so fast. I take gymnastics and I never fall off the balance beam. I know how to square dance and I'm good at it. I call my friends on the phone and we talk for hours. I whisper secrets. I sing. When I wake up in the morning, it's always sort of a letdown as reality hits me. I have to be fed and dressed so I can spend another long day in the happy face room at Spalding Street School. Along with the assortment of teachers we've had in room H5, there have been more classroom aides than I can count. These aides, usually one guy to help with the boys and one lady to help with the girls, do stuff like take us to the bathroom or change diapers on kids like Ashley and Carl, feed us lunch, wheel us where we need to go, wipe mouths, and give hugs. I don't think they get paid very much because they never stay very long, but they should get a million dollars. What they do is really hard, and I don't think most folks get that. It's even hard to keep good teachers for us. I guess I don't blame them for leaving, because like I said, we're a tough bunch to handle sometimes. But once in a while, we get a good one. After squeaking Miss Hyatt for kindergarten and game show Mr. Gross for first grade, Mrs. Tracy breezed into our room for second grade. She figured out I liked books. So she got me some earphones and hooked me up with audiobooks on CD. She started with baby stuff like Dr. Seuss, which my father and I had read when I was two. So after I tossed those on the floor a couple of times, instead of punishing me, she figured out I needed something better. I listened to all of the Babysitter's Club books and those goofy Goosebumps books. She asked me questions after each book and I got every single question right. Things like, which of these helped to solve the mystery? Then she'd show me a pebble, a starfish, and an ink pen. The pebble, of course. She'd cheer after we'd gone through the questions and then hook me up to another book. That year, I listened to all the books by Beverly Cleary and all the books about those boxcar kids. It was awesome. The next year, it all unraveled. I know teachers are supposed to write notes to the next teacher in line so they know what to expect but either Mrs. Tracy didn't do it or Mrs. Billups, our third grade teacher, didn't read them. Mrs. Billups started every morning by playing her favorite CD. I hated it. Old MacDonald had a farm, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the Itsy Bitsy Spider, all sung by children who could not sing. The type of music grown-ups think is all kinds of cute, but it's awful. Mrs. Billups put it on at full volume every single morning, over and over and over. No wonder we were always in a bad mood. Once she had the tin pan band on, Mrs. Billups went over the alphabet every single day with third graders. Now, children, this is an A. How many of you can say A? Good. She'd smile and say good, even if nobody in the class responded. I wondered if she would teach able-bodied third graders the same way. Probably not. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. Now let's move on to B. This is the letter B. Let's all say B. Good. Again to silence. She didn't seem to care. I glanced with longing at the books on tape and the earphones, which, I'd been, which had been shoved into a corner. One day, I guess I'd had enough. Mrs. Billups had expanded from saying the letters to making the sound of each one. Ba, she said soundly, spitting a little as she did. Ba is the sound of the letter B. Let's all say ba together, children. Then Maria, who is always in a good mood, started throwing crayons. Willie began to babble, and I bellowed. I may not be able to make clear sounds, but I can make a lot of noise. 
I screamed because I hated stuff that was just plain stupid. I screeched because I couldn't talk and tell her to shut up. And that made me cry because I'd never be able to tell anybody what I was really thinking. So I screamed and yelled and shrieked. I cried like a two-year-old. I would not stop. Then my tornado explosion took over. I flailed and jerked and basically spazzed out. I kicked so hard that my shoes popped out of the foot straps on my chair. That made me tilt to one side and I screamed even louder. Mrs. Billups didn't know what to do. She tried to calm me down, but I didn't want to be calmed. Even the aides couldn't stop me. Jill and Maria started to cry. Even Ashley, dressed all in yellow that day, looked upset. Freddie spun in his chair around spun his chair around in circles, glancing sideways at me fearfully. Carl hollered for lunch. Then he pooped in his pants again. The whole class was out of control, and I kept screeching. The teacher called Mrs. Anthony, the principal, whose eyes got wide as she opened our door. She took one look at the situation and said tersely, Call her mother. She could not have left more quickly. A moment later, the teacher had my mother on the phone. Mrs. Brooks, this is Melody's teacher, Anastasia Billups. Can you come to the school right away? I knew my mother had to be worried. Was I sick, bleeding, dead? No, she's not ill. She's fine, we think. Mrs. Billups was saying in her most professional sounding teacher voice, we just can't get her to stop screaming. She's got the whole class in an uproar. I could picture my mother on the end, other end of the line trying to figure out what was going on. Luckily, it was her day off. I knew she'd be there in a few minutes. So I gradually calmed down and finally shut up. The other kids quieted down as well, like somebody had clicked this off switch. Old McDonald continued to play. My mother arrived faster than I thought possible. When I saw her jeans and dirty sweatshirt, I realized she dropped everything and jumped in the car. She ran over to me and asked what was wrong. I took a few deep, shuddering breaths. Then I pointed to the alphabet on my talking board and screeched some sounds of frustration. This is about the alphabet? My mother asked. Yes, I pointed, then pounded on the answer. She turned to Mrs. Billups. What were you working on before all the screaming started? Mrs. Billups replied in that superior tone that teachers dressed in nice red business suits use when they're talking to mothers with dirty shirts on. We were reviewing the alphabet, of course. The sound of the letter B, if I recall. I always start with the basics. These children need constant review because they don't retain information like the rest of us. My mother was getting the picture. So you were going over the ABCs, correct? It's February. I beg your pardon? School started in August. You haven't got past the letter B in six months. Mom was bawling and unballing her fist. I've never seen my mother hit anything, but when I see her doing that, I always wonder if she might. Who are you to tell me how to run my class? The teacher asked angrily. And who are you to bore these children with mindless activities? My mother snapped back. How dare you? The teacher gasped. I dare anything for my daughter. Mom replied, her voice dangerous, and for the rest of these children. You don't understand, the teacher began. Mom interrupted her. No, Mrs. Billups, it is you who does not understand. Mom looked like she was trying to calm herself down because she then said, look, have you ever said to yourself, if they show that stupid commercial on TV one more time, I think I'll just scream? Mrs. Billups nodded slowly. Or if I have to sit five more minutes in this tra traffic jam, I'll explode. Yes, I suppose, she admitted. Well, I think that's what happened to Melody, she said to herself. If I have to go over those letters one more time, I'll just scream. So she did. I really don't blame her. Do you? Mrs. Billups looked from my mother to me. I, I guess not. Now that you explain it that way, Mrs. Billups finally said. Her voice now as calm as my mother's. Melody knows her alphabet, all the sounds of all the letters, and hundreds of words on sight. She can add and subtract numbers in her head. We discussed all this at our last parent conference, didn't we? I could tell my mother was trying to control her temper. 
I thought you were exaggerating, the teacher said. Parents are not always realistic when it comes to these children. If you call them these children one more time, I might scream, my mother warned. But Melody does have mental and physical limitations, Mrs. Billups argued, trying to put mom in her place, I guess. You have to learn to accept that. And the fire was back. Melody can't walk. Melody can't talk. But she is extremely intelligent. And you better learn to accept that, mom spat out. The teacher backed up an inch or two. Didn't you read her records from last year, mom demanded. Melody loves listening to books on tape. I try to approach each child with an open mind and not be influenced by other teachers. All the records are in a box someplace. Maybe you should find that box, my mother said, her lips tight. Well, I never, Mrs. Billups countered. Maybe that's your problem, Mom replied with a grin. Then she tilted her head and turned towards the CD player. Oh, one more thing. May I see that wonderful CD you're playing? Of course, Miss Billups said, smiling a little. The children love this. Do they? Mom asked. The teacher lifted the disc from the player. Twinkle, twinkle, silence. Willie sighed out loud. Mom took the CD, dug down in her purse for a moment, gave Mrs. Billups a $5 bill, and deftly snapped the disc in half. That music was cruel and unusual punishment. Freddie and Maria cheered. Gloria whispered, thank you. For a moment, I almost felt sorry for Mrs. Billups. She looked so confused. She just didn't get it. Mom walked over to the sink in our room, turned on the warm water, and soaked a stack of paper towels under the faucet. She came back to me and gently wiped my face with a warm, soggy wad. Nothing had ever felt so soothing. She then brushed my hair, adjusted the straps and buckles on my chair, gave me a quick hug, and went home. Mrs. Billups quit her job after spring break, so we ended up with a series of subs till the end of the year. I think she had figured it figured it would be easy to work with people who were dumber than she was. She was wrong. Chapter 8, and this will be the last chapter for tonight. For a long time, it was just me, my mom, and dad, and my goldfish, Ollie. I was five years old when I got him, and I had him for almost two years before he died. I guess that's old for a goldfish. Nobody knew Ollie's name but me, but that's okay. Ollie had been a prize from a carnival dad had taken me to and I think Ollie's life was worse than mine. He lived in a small bowl on the table in my room. The bottom of the bowl was covered with tiny pink rocks and a fake plastic log sat wedged in the rocks. I guess it was supposed to look like something from under the sea, but I don't think there are any lakes or oceans that really have rocks that color. Ollie spent all day long swimming around that small bowl, ducking through the fake log and then swimming around again. He always swam in the same direction. The only time he changed his course was when mom dropped a few grains of fish food into his bowl each morning and evening. I'd watch him gobble the food, then poop it out, then swim around and around once again. I felt sorry for him. At least I got to go outside and to the store and to school. Ollie just swam in a circle all day. I wondered if fish ever slept. But any time I woke up in the middle of the night, Ollie was still swimming, his little mouth opening and closing like he was trying to say something. One day, when I was about seven, Ollie jumped out of his bowl. I had been listening to music on the radio. Mom had finally figured out I liked the country western station, and I was in a good mood. The music was sounding orangey and yellowish as I listened, and the faint whiff of lemon seemed to surround me. I felt real mellow as I watched Ollie do his thing round and round his bowl. But suddenly, for no reason I could figure, Ollie dove down to the bottom of his bowl, rushed to the top, and hurled himself right out of the bowl. He landed on the table. He gasped and flopped, and I'm sure he was surprised he couldn't breathe. His eyes bulged, and the gills on his side pulsed with effort. I didn't know what to do. He died without water really fast, so I screamed. Mom was downstairs, or maybe outside getting the mail, but she didn't come right away. I screamed again, louder. I cried out. I yelled. I screeched. Ollie continued to flop and gasp, looking more desperate. Ollie needed water. I howled once more, but Mom didn't come running. 
Where could she be? I knew I had to do something, so I reached over to the table and stretched out my arm. I could just barely touch Ollie's bowl. I figured if I could get the fish wet at least a little bit, I might be able to save him. I hooked my fingers on the edge of the fishbowl and I pulled. Water splashed everywhere, all over the table, the carpet, me, and Ollie. He seemed to flop a little less for a second or two, and I kept wailing. Finally, I heard my mother thundering up the stairs. When she came through the door, she took one look at the mess and the dying goldfish and shouted, Melody, what have you done? Why did you knock over the fishbowl? Don't you know a fish can't live without water? Well, of course I knew that. I'm not stupid. Why did she think I'd been screeching and calling for her? She scurried over to the mess, scooped up Ollie, and gently placed him back in the bowl. Then she ran to the bathroom, and I heard her running water, but I knew it was too late. Either because of the time out of the bowl, or because the bathroom water wasn't the right temperature, Ollie didn't survive. Mom came back in and scolded me once more. Your goldfish didn't make it, Melody. I don't get it. Why would you do that to the poor little fish? He was happy in this little world. I wondered if maybe Ollie wasn't so happy after all. Maybe he was sick and tired of that bowl and that log and that circle. Maybe he just couldn't take it anymore. I feel like that sometimes. There was no way I could explain to mom what had happened. I really had tried to save Ollie's life. I just looked away from mom. She was angry and I was too. If she hadn't been so slow, Ollie might have made it. I didn't want her to see me cry. She cleaned up the mess with a sigh and left me with my music and an empty spot on my table. The colors had vanished. It was a long time before I was ready for another pet, but on my eighth birthday, my father brought a big box into the house. He seemed to be have tr having trouble holding on to it. When he set it on the floor in front of me, out exploded a flash of wiggling gold fun. A puppy, a golden retriever puppy. I shrieked and kicked with joy, a puppy. The clumsy little dog raced around the room, sniffing in every corner. I watched her every move, loving her right away. After exploring every table leg and piece of furniture, the puppy stopped, made sure all of us were watching, then squatted and peed right there on the carpet. Mom yelled, but only a little. That's when the dog knew she was in charge. She checked out Dad's bare toes, but she stayed away from Mom, who was trying to soak the spot out of the rug with paper towels and that spray stuff she uses in the kitchen. Finally, the puppy circled my wheelchair around and around like she was trying to figure it out. She sniffed it, sniffed my legs and feet, looked at me for a minute, then jumped right up onto my lap like she'd done it a million times. I barely breathed, not wanting to disturb her. Then, wow. Wow, wow, she turned around three times and made herself comfortable. I think she made a noise like a sigh of satisfaction. I know I did. I stroked her soft back and head as gently as I could. I was the one who named her. Mom and Dad kept subject suggesting dumb names like Fuzzy and Coffee, but I knew as soon as I saw her what her name should be. I pointed to the bowl on the table, which held my most favorite, favorite candies, butterscotch caramel. They're soft enough to melt in my mouth so I don't have to chew and oh, are they delicious. You want to call her candy? Dad asked. I shook my head no, gently so the sleeping puppy wouldn't wake up. Caramel? Mom said. I shook my head once more. Why don't we call her stinky? Dad suggested with a grin. Mom and I just glared at him. I continued to point to the candy dish. Finally, Mom said, I know, you want to call her butterscotch. I wanted to shriek, but I forced myself to stay calm. I tried really hard not to do anything that would knock the puppy off my lap. Ugh, I said softly as I continued to stroke the dog's silky fur. I didn't know that anything could be so soft, and she was all mine. It was the best birthday I ever had. Butterscotch sleeps, butterscotch sleeps on the foot of my bed every night. It's like she read the book on what a great dog ought to do. Bark only when a stranger is at the door. Never pee or poop in the house. She got over that puppy stuff. And keep Melody happy. Butterscotch doesn't care that I can't talk to her. She knows I love her. She just gets it. One day, a few months after I got her, I fell out of my wheelchair. It happens. 
Mom had given me lunch, taken me to the toilet, and wheeled me back into the room. Butterscotch trotted behind, never in the way, just close by me all the time. Mom popped in a DVD for me and made sure my hands were properly positioned so I could rewind and fast forward the film. She didn't notice my seatbelt wasn't fastened, and neither did I. She traveled up and down the stairs doing several loads of laundry. I'm awfully messy. And I guess she had started fixing dinner. The rich aroma of simmering tomato sauce floated up the stairs. Mom knows I love spaghetti. She peeked her head in to check on me and said, I'm going to lie down for a couple of minutes, Melody. Are you okay for a few? I nodded and pointed my arm towards the door to tell her to go ahead. My movie was getting good anyway. Butterscotch sat curled next to my chair. She'd outgrown my lap. So mom blew me a kiss and closed the door. I was watching something I'd seen a million times, The Wizard of Oz. I think most people in the world can quote sections of that movie, no extra brains required, because it's one of those movies that gets played over and over again on cable channels. But I know every single word in it. I know what Dorothy will say before she even opens her mouth. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. It makes me smile. I've never been to Kansas or Oz or anywhere more than a few miles away from home. Even though I knew it was coming, when the movie got to the part where the Tin Man does the stu stiff little dance to the music of, if I only had a heart, I cracked up. I laughed so hard, I jerked forward in my chair and found myself face down on the floor. Butterscotch jumped up immediately, sniffing me and making sure I wasn't hurt. I was fine, but I couldn't get back up in my chair. Worse, I was going to miss the part where the cowardly lion gets smacked on the nose by Dorothy. I wondered how long Mom's nap would last. I didn't scream like that time Ollie had jumped out of the bowl. I wasn't upset, just a little uncomfortable. I tried to flip over, but I couldn't from the position I had landed in. If I could have seen the television from where I'd fallen, I might have been okay on the floor for a little while. Butterscotch makes a great pillow. But Butterscotch went to the closed door and scratched. I could hear her claws ripping at the wood. Dad wouldn't be happy when he saw that. But Mom didn't come, so Butterscotch barked. First a couple of tentative leaps, then louder and more urgent. Finally, she jumped up and threw her whole body against the door, making loud thuds. She barked, then thud. Bark, then thud. Mom couldn't ignore all that racket. I'm sure it was only a few minutes, but it seemed like longer. Mom came to the door, looked groggy. Her hair was all messed up. What's going on here, she began. Then she saw me. Oh, Melody, baby, are you okay? She ran to me, sat down on the floor, and lifted me onto her lap. She checked everything. My arms and legs, my back, my face, my scalp, even my tongue. I wanted to tell her I was fine. All she needed to do was put me back in the chair, but she had to do the mom thing and double check. Butterscotch, you're a good, good girl, she said as she petted the dog and hugged me tight. Doubles on the dog food tonight. I'm sure Butterscotch would have preferred a nice thick bone instead, but she couldn't talk either, so both my dog and I get what they give us. Mom carefully put me back in my chair and made sure my seatbelt was latched correctly. Butterscotch curled up right in front of me, making sure, I guess, that if I slid out again, she'd be there to soften the fall. That dog is amazing. Mom restarted the video from the beginning, but somehow that yellow brick road had lost some of its magic glow. Nobody really gets wishes granted by the great Oz. As I watched, I wondered if I were blown to Oz with my dog, what would we ask the wizard for? Hmm, brains? I've got plenty. Courage? Butterscotch is scared of nothing. A heart? We've got lots of heart, me and my pup. So what would I ask for? I'd like to sing like the cowardly lion and dance like the tin man. Neither one of them did those things very well, but that would be good enough for me. So that concludes for the night, everyone. I hope you have an awesome 4th of July. I hope you continue tuning in and staying up to date on our book. I want you to enjoy the weekend, and I will get back on as quickly as I can to keep us rolling on our chapters. So have a great night. Love you guys. Happy 4th of July.